came to pass, and yet so many people will curse the very thing that they prayed for. Instead of seeing it as freedom, you could see it as a burden. Why? It's a mindset shift. You know, Pastor Kurt, he, he likes to give, give this illustration when we talk about this because he used to always say, oh, man, I have to go to Paris this month. Okay, pause. No, you don't have to go to Paris this month. You get to go to Paris this month. How many of y'all were like, wow, I'd really like to go to Paris? <laughs> Just three of us? Okay. So... Maybe nobody else wants to go, or or I have to go to Finland, or I have you know, or wherever it was. And I'm like, first of all, there are people who actually want to listen to you. Shouldn't we be grateful for that? Amen. Right? I mean, I'm still astounded. Y'all keep showing up to hear me. I, I I I realize it's Christ in me. Don't get too excited. But I mean, it's kind of like it's a little bit of a of a wow. Like people want to hear me minister. That's Amazing. Cookies. <laughs> cookies are afterwards. We'll pay you later. Just keep it, keep it under your hood. But <clears throat> so we get to do these things, right? Because when God calls us, it's not a burden that God called us. It's a blessing. Amen. And then we look at what we get to do, not what we have to do, right? And then when Pastor Kurt made that mindset shift, it became so much easier for him to travel because it, he wasn't viewing it as a burden, he was viewing it as a blessing, right? Plus, his wife helps because when she travels with him, that's me. I have to use vacation time at work, and so we have mandatory vacation. We have to have mandatory fun time when I travel with him. So um, he's like, I'm not on vacation, but I am. <laughs> so... You know, but, but we have to be watchful as how we're wear, watch, looking at things because you, wherever you are, freedom comes with you unless you choose to carry bondage. Do you see how that mind, simple mindset shift determines whether you're in bondage or freedom? What, oh, do you have to do that? No, I get to do that. You know, honestly, I could go on that line of, of thought for like the rest of the time that we're together because I can think of so many illustrations where people turn something that is, that is a God blessing into a burden. What, what in your life have you done that with? Right? My husband had to correct me. Because when he travels, I don't cook as much. And this whole meal planning thing, nobody put that in the job description of adulthood. I did not read it anywhere. And so, you know, I was like, oh, you want to eat again? And he, you know, <laughs> and he's the skinny one, but the man eats a lot and often. And so I'm like, and he wants two hot meals a day typically, right? And so all of a sudden I'm like, <clears throat> did we negotiate this? But do you understand that I can look at that as a burden? The very man who I prayed for, the man who is the, is the man of my dreams, I could see as a burden instead of a blessing? You know, your attitude towards the thing that you view as a burden is usually poor. Mm -hmm. Your attitude toward that thing, right? So if, you're, if your attitude toward your job is that it's a burden, you're going to have an attitude that needs to be corrected at work. Okay, I'll just look at the people online. You all are very uncomfortable right now. <laughs> If your spouse has become a burden to you, then you need to shift because your attitude has followed your, your view of that. 
your kids, your grandkids, your parents. You know, I am blessed that my parents are here on the planet. I am. And as long as they're here, I see it as a blessing, not a burden. Yeah, but do you, yeah, don't worry about my parents. They're great. Yes, you know, every, every relationship, you're going to have interactions that need to improve. Amen? Amen? Do you know that if, you, if there's another person on the planet that you have a conversation with, you are bound to find something you do not agree about? <laughs> you're going to. Does that mean you don't love them or honor them or respect them? No. But here's the thing. However you view that relationship will impact your attitude within that relationship. Look it, I'm already helping you how to improve your relationships. <laughs> it's an attitude. Freedom from carrying that burden or seeing that relationship as a burden, that freedom that you will experience will pour into that interaction that you have. I'm not telling you it's going to change the other people. It's going to change whether or not you're free in that interaction. Do you know some people are stubborn? Oh, you guys haven't met those. <laughs> mm. Stubborn people are going to just do their own thing, but it doesn't have to change who you are right? Your actions or inactions do not dictate my reaction. The word should dictate my reaction. Amen. Remember, love and live like Jesus. Now, I admit freely that sometimes if I'm tired or hangry, <laughs> it shows. I, I don't hide it as well as I should. Sleep deprivation and hunger are a bad combination for me, okay? Sleep deprivation doesn't really do me well. I ain't going to lie. But I have a choice as to how I treat you if I'm sleep deprived. Now, Philippians 4.13 in the Amplified tells me, and hopefully you too, that I don't have to do this in my own strength, right? <clears throat> When we see that we don't have to do things in our own strength, that we do this, I have strength for what? Even interacting with stubborn people? No, for real? All right, good, pay attention. I have strength for all things in Christ. Where are you? Are you always in there? Do you ever come out? Do you, do you maybe, do you, do you like shed him for a little while to go take a shower? No. Are you like, hey, you know, I'm going to go swimming in the mud with the pigs, so I'm just going to take off Christ for a little while, or, or do you stay in Christ? Amen. Here's the thing. You might get Jesus pretty dirty, Amen. but he's in the pig trough with you. The scripture says that he, I will be with you in trouble. Even when you're in trouble, he's there. You just might not be paying attention. So you at all times have, have, have strength for all things in Christ who empowers you. Does he empower you? What does that mean? It means that he brings his power. He puts it on the inside of you and you have it. He has empowered you. I am, say it, let's read it together. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Is that true? Yes. Philippians 2.13 in the Amplified. Okay, so I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Right? So he's real specific here. Not in your own strength. Hallelujah. Not in your own strength. 
You're not dealing with the trials, tribulations, problems, attitudes of other people, the, you know, whatever pops up, you're not dealing with that in your own strength. Well, let me rephrase. We don't need to deal with this in our own strength. Do you remember that uh, just recently we talked about the fig leaves, right? And that literally Adam and Eve's response to, oh my goodness, I'm naked, was to sew some fig leaves together and make clothes for themselves. They were wearing salad. And I don't know about you, but my lettuce wilts. So there's no longevity in it, but that's self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency is you sowing your own fig leaves to cover your problems. You're going to figure it out yourself. But we're supposed to be self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency and not do it in our own strength. For it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure, satisfaction, and delight. Now, let me ask you this. If in the midst of your interactions with other people, right? So this is week one, how to improve your relationships. <clears throat> I know, we're, we said we do it on Saturday and Sunday, but I'm giving you a preview. <laughs> if you're going to improve your relationships, don't they need to start with you? How many of us want the other person to change? Just change them. You know, you're actually his child, and you should be listening to him. All right, I'm sorry, let me rephrase. I should be listening to him because I'm his child. And so if I want to have a better relationship with somebody else, I can't rely on them. I need to rely on me and not me in me, Christ in me, not of my own sufficiency, but I'm self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Cause you know, I've tried to change and it's futile and in vain until I want to be transformed into Jesus's likeness. Now, here's the thing. We can, we, could, we can come up with titles of the way that people are. You know, like uh, Greg Moore likes to call them sandpaper people, just the people who just scratch you the wrong way. Um, you know, and there's, there's, there's just a bunch of ways that you could refer to those people, right? Um, and probably somewhere in the world, to someone, you are that person. You're the sandpaper person for someone. <clears throat> but for you, if you want to improve your interactions with people, you need to ask the Lord to help you to continue to change into his likeness. Because did you know that Jesus interacted with some sandpaper people? How many times did people try to trick him, trap him, get him to get him to be confused or make mistakes or whatever. People were doing that to him his whole life, right? His brothers were mocking him. His, his, family, his family would would do things that they ought not do. His, his, you know, disciples, Peter's sitting there denying him, right? I mean, he didn't have it all rainbows and kittens, right? And so we know we're not going to either because in John 16, he says, in this world, you will have trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the powers of darkness and deprived them of the power to harm you. Right? He did it for us. And he tells us, be of good cheer. Well, why am I going to be a good cheer when there's trials and tribulations? Because he gave you the power to overcome them. He's defeated the enemies of darkness. They're not your problem. Here's looking at you, kid. You're your problem. Who's your problem? Do you know the devil's not your problem? He's a distraction. 
He creates distractions to get you off course so that you keep on heading. You miss the sign that says, oh, this is Martin County. Oh, this is Palm Beach County. Oh, this is Broward County. Welcome to Key West. Hey, you're at the southernmost point. <coughs> you're not even paying attention to everything that's telling you you're going the wrong direction because he's the distractor. It should be so clear, right? The mile markers are going down instead of up. There should be something that tells us that, right? But did you ever, have you ever been on the highway, like specifically the turnpike? Because I always use mile markers on the turnpike specifically. Um, did you ever, were you ever on the turnpike and you're like, you want to see the next mile marker so that you kind of gauge where you're at? This sure. is back pre-GPS because now people are just like, oh, I just look at my ways and... But you could like in your mouth, in your head, you could do the math. I know I'm gonna get off at exit 142, and I'm currently at exit one. Oh man, I passed it and didn't see it. Or there's a truck in the way and you can't see the mile marker. See, that's what happens to us. The devil becomes a distraction. He catches us off course, and so you don't even realize you start going the wrong way. And it's, I love our turnpike because it's really easy to go the wrong way. You come out of those, you come out of the plaza now, yeah. and like you're like, oh, how did I get turned around? I was supposed to be going southbound, and all of a sudden I'm going northbound. Yeah. You never did that? Okay, well, I have, right? And so you need to be able to pay attention, but if there's all these distractions, mm -hmm. and understand it's not the external stuff that's messing you up. Right. It's what's going on on the inside of you. And so if you're not living in a state of peace, of harmony, of a soul assured of its salvation, if you're not living in that state, it's very easy to give place to those distractions. It's very easy to see your blessings as burdens. And it's very easy to start interacting with people based on your flesh rather than who you are in Christ. It happens easily. But... It's also easy to turn around. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to be where you need to be immediately, right? Because if you hit the southernmost point and you're trying to get out of Florida and hit the Georgia line, you've gone the wrong way. It's easy to turn around. It's just going to take some time to restore that relationship. It's going to take some time to get back to where you want to be. But if you know you're going in the right direction, it doesn't matter how long it takes because you will get there. We don't have to get discouraged. Don't quit. Because listen, if you get discouraged and you quit, you're probably going to hang out in Homestead or Miami and you don't want to do that either. <laughs> right? You, wanna, you want to keep going and the way to keep going is to acknowledge, okay, I made a mistake, but I've turned around. Now that I've turned around, I'm going to stay on course. If I, if, you know, if I have to pull off the road to go to the rest stop or get gas, I'm going to make sure I pull on and keep going the right direction. I'm not going to quit. If we do not quit, we cannot be defeated. We can have a restoration. We can have our relationships restored. We can have better relationships with people who we're in relationships with if we'll let the Lord change us. And you know, sometimes we don't, why is it always me? Why not you? Why not you? Can I ask, especially when it comes to relationships, why wouldn't we want to be the person to make the changing? What, why wouldn't we want to? Now, understand what I'm saying when I'm saying changing is that we're going to change more and more into his image. Why wouldn't we want to? What would be the hindrance to keep us from being the very people that God created us to be? Why would we, oh, well, why can't they change? Listen, the reality is relationships are amazing when both people are following Jesus and behaving like Jesus. Do you know how much friction is in that relationship? None. The only time the friction shows up is when one or both people stop acting like Jesus. You can stop acting like Jesus at any point in time and still be 
saved, right? There's plenty of Christians who act nothing like Jesus, but we're going to see them in heaven. We're probably seeing each other right now, right? You, you ever have a day you ain't acting like Jesus? We call them bad hair days. Mm, don't lie. We've all done it. We've all, we've all fleshed out. We all got carnal. And you know, our relationships suffer in those moments. When we act out on our carnality, when we act out in the flesh, when we give people a piece of our mind, your relationships get affected negatively, right? When you walk in the spirit, did you ever have anybody curse you out and it just didn't phase you at all? I have. Like, it, I don't care what you say about me. Your opinion of me doesn't matter, right? Now, if my husband cursed me out, it might impact me. I ain't going to lie. He never has, so we don't have any test case on that. And I expect that he never will because he's pretty amazing. But you, if you allow that person to have a sphere of influence over you, you're not paying attention about what Jesus has said about you. Right? Because what has he said of you? He has said that you were accepted in the beloved. He has said that you are the beloved. He has said that you are a child of the living God. He has said that you are redeemed, that you are righteous, that you are holy, that you're a priesthood, that you are his, that you're his handiwork, that he loves you. So now whose opinion are you elevating above whom's, right? So now if all of a sudden I'm going to get down in the mud with you because you start cursing me out or giving me your opinion of me, then all I've done is come down to fight in the flesh. And God did not give me those weapons. The weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, right? And you're not going to create in my mind a stronghold that God didn't put there. What, what's the mindset? Well, if you say this, and God says this, this is the way that opinion goes. Yours is worth very, very little, and his is worth everything. There's no, oh, you know, it's, uh, it's a fight. There is no fight. There is no fight, because I know who he said I am. He who has anointed me is God, not you, right? He who shed his blood for me is Jesus, not you. He who redeemed me is Jesus, not you. You couldn't redeem me if you wanted to. Amen. You don't have what it takes. And you don't love me like that. Right? And so when we see that, we make that mindset shift. Now all of a sudden, I don't have to react to people cursing me out. Or telling me that I'm stupid or whatever it is, right? Talking bad about me behind my back. It doesn't matter. But can I, anybody ever heard somebody else talk about someone else behind their back, right? How, how safe do you feel when you're not around them? Do you ever wonder if they say that about you when you're not there? So I want you to think about that for a moment. Now, here's the thing. Don't you think other people start to realize that all that person does is talk about you behind your back mm -hmm. or talk about other people behind their back? What do you think the value that other people put on their opinion is? Right. See, and you're worried about everybody else's opinion or, oh, well, but what if they talk about about me? Everybody knows who they are. They talk bad about everybody. They're not going to put that much weight on that person's opinion of you. So why are you getting it so wrapped up in your head that it matters? And really, if somebody's walking around saying, oh, Terry's a purple elephant. Oh, that Terry, she's just a purple elephant. You should see her trunk. Uh. Then does it matter that they're saying that I'm a purple elephant? Do I know I am not a purple elephant? 
Yes, I know I am not a purple elephant. Therefore, if people, I don't care if a thousand people come up and say, you're a purple elephant. I'm going to say, you're blessed. <laughs> I caught myself. You're blessed in Jesus' name. <laughs> I'm going to say, I just pray for the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened in Jesus' name. How's that? That better? You almost caught me. <laughs> but do you, do you understand? It doesn't matter how many people say that you're whatever, right? You need to know who you are because now I don't have to treat you in light of telling me I'm a purple elephant because I know who I am. Let me, let me show you one of my favorite illustrations of this. And just bear with me a moment. I think we're going to Luke. I think, I think. Stand by. Nope. All right. I am looking for, here's your, here's your opportunity. Show off. I am looking for Jesus to wash the feet. John, John 15? John. All right, all right, thank you. Yes, you are correct. Thank you. All right, John 13, let's start in verse 1. I looked right over that, and I thank you for seeing it. Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he put, put, poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter and said to him, Simon said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I'm doing now you do not understand, but you will know after this. Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is, com but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If then I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you who do them. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me... <coughs> has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him whom sent me. When Jesus had said these things, he, he was troubled in spirit. Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Okay. Okay. Now, I want you to go down. Oh, well, I guess we're close enough, but um, all right, we'll keep going. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. We know that's John because John at the end tells us, and the disciple whom Jesus loved was me. Um, 
was this disciple. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask him of whom he spoke. So <coughs> Peter tells John, hey, ask him who he's talking about. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus said, it is whom I, he whom I shall place a piece of bread and when I have dipped, when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him and said, to, and then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Okay, now, that took all that time to read this to say, Jesus knew who Judas was, and he still got down and washed his feet. Now, if we're going to act like Jesus, now, I, I have a confession to make. Some of you know this already. Some of you don't. I am not a feet person. And I look at this scripture and I'm like, Jesus, if you ever have us do a foot washing ceremony, I need to be so overflowing with the Holy Spirit that I don't, it doesn't bother me. Because right now it would bother me. But Jesus knew who was about to betray him. He knew it before he washed his feet. And yet he still did not treat Judas any differently than he treated the other ones. So much so that they didn't know who it was that was going to betray him. Now, you need to understand Jesus knew who it would be. There was no question. The one whom I dipped the bread and handed to him, that's the one. We got it. Right? Jesus knew who was figuratively speaking, going to stab him in the back. And he never treated Judas in light of it. Now, we don't walk around and look for people to stab us in the back because they just show up anyway. We don't need to go looking for them. But if we are truly going to be like Jesus our relationships are going to be based on the way our Savior behaved. Listen, I'm going to give you the benefit of belief until you're out of breath. I'm going to believe you can change. I'm going to believe that you'll do better. I'm going to believe that you'll receive Jesus. But in the meantime, the only thing that matters is how I treat you, not how you treat me. See, that'll change everything if you'll shift the way that you look at it. Now, who are you doing this for? Are you doing it for the sandpaper person? Are you doing it for Judas? No, you're doing it for Jesus. Never be confused whether you're doing it for Judas or for Jesus. It's always for Jesus, right? Because we all have had a Judas in our life, some more than others, right? Some of us have had more than our fair share of a Judas in our life. But the reason why we can treat people good, even if they treat us bad, is because of Jesus. Jesus has always been good to us, and we can always treat people good too. Amen? Amen. 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 So do not miss out on the next four weeks when we improve our relationships, finances, health, and relationships with Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. And in order to do any of that, you need Jesus. Right, Minister Curtis? Yes, ma'am. Yes, you do. Did y'all get something out of that? That was very good. Thank I you. love you. Hallelujah. That's good stuff. Amen? Thank you. Now, that doesn't mean you can't skip out on Sunday. You can skip out. Amen? That means you can't skip out on Sunday. Right? Because you just got a taste. Thank you, Lord. If there's somebody here that never has received Jesus... Or maybe you're listening on the internet or by recording. You can make Jesus the Lord of your life no matter where you are. You can, you know, as one preacher, you know, he, he is very, uh, very open about where he received the Lord. He said he was sitting on the toilet. <laughs> Amen. I don't know if I tell everybody that, but, hey, he, he doesn't mind. And so, you know, wherever Jesus finds you, that's where, that's where you need to receive him. Amen. And so if you're by your head and close your eyes and you pray this prayer after me, and mean it from your heart, you will be born again. Everybody, let's say this together. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for my sins, and I believe God raised you from the dead. I believe in my heart that you are alive right now, 
And I confess you with my mouth that you are now my Lord and you are now my Savior. I thank you for receiving me into the family and making me your child. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I believe I have eternal life. My name is written in heaven, never to be blotted out. And I thank you for taking my life and doing something with it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. If you just receive the Lord, if you'll see one of our ushers, or if you'll send us an email at connect at reallifefl.com, we'll send some information to you that's going to help in your walk with the Lord. Are you ready to give tonight? Amen. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand. Or you can, uh, actually, we're going to not receive it in a bucket, but you can put it in a receptacle right beside the, the exit door. Um, but if you can, if you're writing, writing a check, you can write it out to RLC or Real Life Church. And you can also text to give and use that option as well. It says in, uh, this is in Philippians chapter 4, a little bit further down than Pastor Terry was reading. And in verse 19, he says, out of the Amplified, And my God will liberally supply, fill to the full your every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And, of course, up here in the verse that she was talking about, verse 13, it says that I am, and the last part of that, I am sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. And so, you know, God wants us to have an abundance in every area, not just finances, in every area, because that's the kind of God he is. He's an abundant God. He didn't hold back in any area. Amen. Amen. You know, he became the poorest of the poor so that we could be the riches of the rich. He did it just like that. He, that's, he did it for that purpose. And so we need to be able to receive the riches that he has in store for us. And part of receiving that is by sowing into the kingdom of God. That's one avenue. You know, he's got many areas that we need to sow into that he put, he's put on our heart. But one is to sow into the church. Amen. And so if you've got your tithes and offerings ready, lift it up and let's confess this over it. Say it with me. Say, Father, thank you for blessing me. I give these tithes and offerings into your kingdom, into your hands, and your hands are multiplied. I believe I will receive an abundant harvest from the multiplied seed. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can, uh, just don't forget, you can put it on the, in a receptacle just on, outside of those doors. Also, what Pastor Terry was talking about is how to improve your relationships, finances, health, relationship with Jesus. Coming up the next four weeks, um, beginning April 15th. And so that is every Saturday night, Sunday morning. And we'll also, as she just did, be talking about some of that on Wednesday night. Our mission here at Real Life Church is to make a marshal disciples who know Jesus and love and live like him. This coming Friday night is the next Real Life Girlfriends meeting. Amen. That's April 14th. That's 7 p.m. Transformational love. Amen. Minister Diana, we minister in that. Glory to God. And also, if, uh, don't forget, we mentioned before that, before the service, uh, before Pastor Terry came up, we're living free in 23 at RLC. Amen. And that's what we continue to be ministering on. Healing School is April 27th through the 29th, and registration is now open. And you can go on curtowen.com and register that way, follow the prompts there. And um, also, Minister's Manor is May 1st. Corporate Prayer is every Tuesday night, beginning at 630. And if you'd like to become part of any ministry or part, part of Real Life Church um, or being water baptized or whatever, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. But, you know, there's, um, there's several people that are going to be out of our children's ministry uh, coming up. And as a matter of fact, starting now, um, just every, the devil is attacking everywhere he can. And so we have to stand strong and we have to fill in the gaps. Amen. And we're a family here. And, and you know, if, if one ministry suffers, well, then, you know, all the ministry suffers. It's just like one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. Well, one, you know, ministry, you know, if they're lacking, then we need to fill in the gaps. And so thanks be to God, we've got helpers that have stepped up and we're able to help out. But we need more teachers. We need more helpers in children's ministry and in the nursery. And so, you know, don't be too proud. Don't feel like, well, I'm not equipped. 
Well, neither was the first person that stepped in there. Amen? Neither was I. How many is equipped? How many, maybe you're equipped now. How many started a ministry and you weren't equipped? Everybody better raise your hand because you didn't equip yourself. Amen? Jesus equipped you when you stepped in. Amen? You know, most of the time, the equipping doesn't, be, doesn't start, and then now I can do that ministry. No, it's like I've called you to that ministry, and I've equipped you for that ministry. Now get to doing it. Amen? And then we're like, well, I don't know. I ain't never done this before. I've equipped you. <laughs> Amen? We need to go back to what Pastor Terry was talking about, is what's, whose opinion are we listening to? Whose word are we hearing? The equipper? Or the one that's talking us out of our equipment. Amen? So let's get involved. Amen? Father, we love you and we thank you for providing for us, Lord, everything we have need of. Thank you for the word that we've received, Father. Lord, we're going to do something with it. And Lord, I thank you for divine appointments, Father. Lord, send us to someone and send someone to us, Father, that, Lord, need to hear about your love, need to hear about your goodness. And, Father, we'll be quick to share and, Lord, we'll be genuine in it. We thank you for the results in Jesus' name. Amen. I love y'all.